can we reverse plaque? A Harvard Health Letter publication. So you're going to see on here that I don't necessarily agree with everything that this article says, but it's a great article to put out there in front of you and maybe hear some reactions on. First quote, I don't agree with. Making plaque disappear is not possible. Well, actually, I do agree with that. You can't make it disappear, but you can shrink it and you can stabilize it. Says cardiologist Dr. Christopher Cannon, a Harvard Medical School professor. And again, there's the link on the bottom right if you have interest in going to take a look at it. Now, he says the key is lowering LDL. That's an area that I don't agree with. Making lifestyle changes, yes, I do agree with. High cholesterol levels encourage the formation and growth of plaque. That's according to Dr. Cannon. Again, I've got plenty of people with familial hypercholesterolemia. These are LDL levels in the hundreds, as in 200 or more. And you'd still tend to not see problems until and unless they start developing insulin resistance or smoking or some of the other significant risk factors. So the reality is, yes, high LDL in the blood, if it's really, really high, can and does become a risk factor, but it's not as important as most folks, including Dr. Cannon, seem to think. Plaques put you at risk for heart attack and stroke. No question. As I said before, heart attacks, the number one cause of death. Strokes, the number one cause of permanent disability. So plaque is pretty important. And it's amazing that our practice as a culture, the physicians that make up our medical community and the patients, the medical standards committees, all it's amazing and frustrating that the practice is so poor. And in fact, when you get back to it, that's what the book is all about. How to measure plaque, how to know what to do next. Now, how does plaque form? Cholesterol lodges within the walls of the artery. That's true, but again, I think he skipped over some of the most important parts. For example, how does cholesterol get into the walls of the artery? Well, it actually happens when we injure that lining of the artery. Anybody remember? The intima, it's also called an endothelial lining. Endothelial is a generic term. This is epithelium. That's the out, epi means out, endo means in. And intima is the specific name for the endothelium lining the artery wall. Now, what usually causes that? About 80% of it's caused by some combination of high insulin, and high blood glucose. Other things can cause it as well. Smoking's known to cause it. LP little a is known to cause it. LP little a is what hit Bob Harper, caused Bob Harper's heart attack at age 51, despite the fact that he was a well-known fitness guru. So yes, he also had diabetes and prediabetes in his family as well. So. I personally suspect that Harper had some of that going on as well. Cholesterol lodges within the walls of the artery. Like I said, he skipped a couple of really critical steps. You got to have that injury to the intima before that cholesterol gets in the, to the wall of the artery, lodges and creates plaque. And if you don't know that piece, you don't know how that damage occurs that's where the rubber meets the road. That's where your opportunity for, for prevention occurs. As I said, 80% of this is some combination of high glucose, high insulin, smoking, LP little a. There can be some uh, contribution from really, really high LDL as well. And other forms of inflammation like psoriatic arthritis. You don't need to know or remember that term, but inflammatory diseases. And here's some inflammatory diseases. Rheumatoid arthritis is the most well-known. Psoriatric or psoriasis-related arthritis. Lupus, even Hashimoto's thyroiditis, as well as inflammatory bowel disease. So all of those things can cause injury to the intima, the lining of the artery wall. Once that injury occurs, then the cholesterol slips through that lining we used to think it made 
holes in the lining, but some good research came out of University of Texas just a couple of years ago showing that it really doesn't create a complete hole. It doesn't denude that intima layer, but what it does do is it injures that intima layer. So the intima layer allows cholesterol to pass through. Once that cholesterol has passed through the intima layer, it gets stuck between the intima and the media layer. So to fight back, the body sends white cells to trap the cholesterol, which then turn into foamy cells that ooze more fat and cause more inflammation. And guess what they call those foamy cells? If it's macrocytes and those macrocytes join together, the official name is a foam cell. So those foamy cells are called foam cells. There are other cells that cause this as well. But again, he is getting to an important piece that most people totally miss, totally don't understand. It's not just cholesterol. It is this inflammatory process that, again, causes the major danger. When you do have a heart attack or stroke, it's not the plaque itself. It's not the cholesterol itself. It's these inflammatory components from the white cells. They're called cytokines, biomarkers. Things like that can actually trip the blood clotting mechanisms. So again, there's a little bit more subtlety, but much more important facts within the subtle th parts that just totally get left out when people talk about and think about plaque. So he does cover another item that again is very subtle, but also very important, muscle cells in the artery wall. Now, do you remember what that would be? Media, you remember the intima is the lining, the media is that muscle cell lining of the artery wall. It's what keeps your, for example, when your aorta gets these high blood pressures in it or any of your arteries, if it were just the intima, it would blow right apart. But that muscle layer keeps it structurally intact. Now here's what happens with 9P21. Does that ring any bells? Nine is the ninth chromosome, the P21 area. That's the heart attack gene. For those of you who've read or heard of the book by Brad Bale and Amy Donine, Beat the Heart Attack Gene, that's what they're talking about. They're talking about 9P21. Now, 9P21 always used to be, it was known originally as a cancer gene, then a heart attack gene, and then it was found it was a diabetes gene, but not just a diabetes gene. Why did I go down that bunny hole? This is the reason. 9P21 also increases this probability that muscle cells in the media layer of the artery wall are triggered to form a cap. Now, here's part of the problem. That cap, you want a stable cap there in this, and that's not what you get with inflammation. So we'll leave it at that point. But 9P21 has two components. One of them impacts this muscle cell multiplication. Now the soft plaque beneath the cap is dangerous. It can break open, form a clot, and cause a heart attack or stroke. So Absolutely no argument there with me, as you know, if I've said it once on those 700 videos, I've probably said it a thousand times. Now, can we reverse plaque? Busting the cholesterol myth. Cholesterol is often vilified as the bad guy, but we need cholesterol to make vitamin D, hormones, bile, and the coverings of our cells. So the liver produces 75% of the body's cholesterol. As you can see, I would agree with Dr. Christopher Cannon, who wrote this article for Harvard Health, on these items completely, that LDL is not the bad guy that we make it out to be. Our body makes it, so obviously, even if it were the bad guy, just cutting it out of the diet wouldn't work anyway. Anyway, when cells need more cholesterol, the liver sends it through particles called LDLs, low-density lipoproteins. So for example, these LDLs do have proteins in them, lipo meaning fat and protein. I was just getting ready. I was hoping to finish my burger. Now that sounds terrible, doesn't it? This is an impossible burger. It's made out of plant materials. I don't really consider plant materials. I mean, I used to be much more plant-based. I don't worry about that so much anymore, but I was reading about impossible burgers and I'm probably going to use those more. They taste just like a regular burger. And here's the thing. I'm doing it now more for environmental purposes than health purposes. You get about 20 to 50 times less impact on the environment when you use plants rather than animals.
but wait a minute. You say, yeah, but you're going to kill yourself with all those carbs in that bread. That's keto bread. Now, so if I eat that with some olive oil mayonnaise, and again, I know I'll get haters for all of those items, but if I eat that and that goes into my stomach, it's sort of like if I poured oil into this bottle of water. If I left it alone for a while, you get a layer of oil and a layer of water with the oil floating on top, right? Now, why did I go down that bunny hole? Because he's talking about LDL. So here's the thing. LDLs, it's a protein. The body makes proteins to take fats like that and break them into tiny particles that will not form what's called an embolus, a big blob like a clot. Because if our body didn't form those proteins and break those fat layers down, when we eat something like this, it would blow our brains out, it'd blow our heart out. It'd be just like having huge heart attacks and strokes from fat emboli, not clot emboli. Fat embolus, clot embolus. An embolus is just a big blob of something that can stop the flow through an artery. So that's what LDL is. LDL, HDL, IDL, intermittent density lipoprotein. HDL is high density lipoprotein. LDL is obviously low density lipoprotein. And guess what? Yes, you do have VLDL. And guess what that means? Very low density lipoproteins. And again, all of these things are proteins which have, for the biochemists, the geeks among you, how do these proteins work? They have two things. They have a lipid side, a hydrophobic side, and a hydrophilic side, which has more anions on it. So they actually form uh, little pockets where the fat goes into the pocket, and the outside of that pocket is has an ionic or a polarized component. So therefore, the outside likes water, the inside doesn't like water. That's what lipoproteins are all about. And the LDL lipoproteins are the ones that you find oxidized in plaque. So when you cut an artery open on a post-mortem, when somebody's got a plaque, you go in, you analyze that plaque. The vast majority of that's going to be oxidized LDL. Now, there's more to it than that, especially if they died from a heart attack or stroke. If they died from a heart attack or stroke, we know that they've got what else in there? The inflammation, those cytokines, those biomarkers, TNF alpha, myeloperoxidase, the enzymes that leukocytes or white cells use to digest hard plaque, LPPLA2, the enzyme that monocytes or foam cells use to digest LDL. So again, Pardon the digression, but it was obviously on topic and to get into some explanation of what this Dr. Cannon is talking about. So he says too much LDL in the blood can cause cholesterol to lodge within artery walls and form plaques. That's why LDL is known as bad cholesterol. And as you might guess, I'm not 100% there with him on that. I think I'm not going to repeat what I think about that. While LDL deposits cholesterol into plaques, high-density HDL particles help remove cholesterol away from plaques. That's why HDL is referred to as, quote, good cholesterol. And again, I would say that's about concept at least five to 50 years old. And as you can see, most of the standard bearers in medicine, this guy's from Harvard, they've got him writing something for their public domain information. There's still a lot of people that believe LDL is bad cholesterol, HDL is good. I will tell you, there's a lot of reason to think exactly that. But I would also say it's a little bit more complicated. It's a little bit different. Doctors target softer, unstable plaque. I would agree with that. Patients will often come to see me because they had a positive calcium score. And they forget that when we have soft plaque, it's not going to show up on a calcium score because calcium is indicative of stable plaque, stable hardened plaque. So why do we look at a calcium score anyway? Because we can, and there clearly is an, a correlation. If you've got a lot of calcium in the, that calcium CT 
of the arteries of your heart, you do have a much higher risk for heart attack and stroke. Why is that? Because you've been through that, those cycles of laying down plaque, getting inflamed, getting better, calcifying that plaque. Now, why does that become an issue? It's like I'm seeing me, I'll typically have somebody who's very worried, upset, and concerned. Oh, doc, I had a calcium score. It was over a thousand. I've got problems. I'm going to die. I've got plenty of people who've been through that and they've come out the other end and they feel great. They feel fine. They're very comfortable in where they need to be. And they're very comfortable in the fact that their plaque is now stable. But quite often we have a hump to get over. And here's where that hump is. They start losing that weight. They lose the 30 pounds. We get them on an appropriate statin and Lipitor is clearly not one of them. Then we get them stabilized. Well, then what happens? We get the carbs out of their diet. We discover that prediabetes that they didn't know about and their doctor didn't know about. We get that controlled and they start stabilizing their plaque. Well, what happens to their calcium? Yeah. They go back, they get a calcium score and it has increased significantly. They were expecting to do a victory lap and I've warned them, look, once you take soft plaque and you stabilize it, you're gonna calcify it. So expect in that situation, the situation that I just described and I go through it on a regular basis with patients, Expect to get an increase in your calcium score. Long term, you may have some decrease, but usually calcium, once it gets stuck in there, as he said in the very beginning, plaque doesn't entirely go away. The game at that point, the goal, and it's very practical, very, very doable, is not to totally get rid of plaque and calcium, although I've done it, I've seen people do it. It's to stabilize that plaque. So according to Dr. Cannon, if we have a 30% blockage in the artery from soft plaque, the goal is to try to suck out the cholesterol from the inside so the plaque shrivels down to 15% and leaves nothing inside it. I would sort of agree, sort of not. It's not sucking the cholesterol out quite so much as it is sucking out that inflammatory process, that liquid process, the part that destabilizes that plaque. Now, how do you get that plaque stabilize. He says, how do you get cholesterol out of the plaque? He says, by lowering levels of cholesterol in the blood. And I would say, first stop the original injury, that recurring insulin bump, that recurring hyperglycemia bump. Statins, yes, they do help. Even if you're a statin hater, you can't change the science that shows that Statins tend to help. One of the reasons I said Lipitor is not, I use it very rarely. I've used it in maybe a couple of patients out of many, many hundred over the past few years because the goal for statins for most of my patients is not so much to decrease cholesterol. For a few of the familial hypercholesterolemia patients, yes, for those we want to decrease LDL. But the bigger issue is we want to get that inflammation out of that plaque. Lipitor is not as good at that as a couple of others, as most others, in fact. So again, whether you like it or not, statins do help. But nothing helps like stopping the original injury, discovering that what's causing the problem and getting control of it. And as I said, you know, given what I do, it's not that difficult to find it. You know, 80% of the time, it's going to be prediabetes unrecognized, undiagnosed prediabetes. Statins are used most often to reduce LDL cholesterol levels. Well, that is true. That's what most docs use it for. They block the liver enzyme that promotes cholesterol production. And you may remember we mentioned that a couple of times recently, HMG-CoA reductase. For those of you who are totally comfortable with the supplements area, but not so much with medications, there are a couple of supplements that are HMG-CoA reductase inhibitors, like statins. One of them is red yeast rice. Here's the thing. The original statins were made out of red yeast rice. So from my perspective, I think I get better quality control if I use a statin, but there are better statins now anyway. There's another supplement that a lot of people know about, bergamot. Bergamot's a long story. That was one of our more popular recent videos Bergamot's been used for 
or oh, millennia. A millennium is many hundreds of years and maybe even over a thousand. It's been used in tea, Earl Grey tea. That's got bergamot in it. Unfortunately, the majority of Earl Grey tea has a cheap imitation that was made by the organic chemists because the price of bergamot is pretty high. You can only get, I think it's two or three millimeters of, or cc's of milliliters or cc's of the oil out of a hundred oranges. So they made it very, very cheap by making it artificial. The farmers in Calabria, Italy, beautiful place. It's gorgeous. Take a look at it or better yet, go back and watch my video on it. Those guys formed a uh, cooperative and they called it Bergamet brand of bergamot. And they actually did some science and showed that it's clearly better than the organic chemistry lookalike. So again, bergamot is also an HMG CoA reductase inhibitor if you're so inclined and so interested. And Dr. Cannon finishes up saying zetamide or zetia can inhibit cholesterol absorption in the digestive tract. Now, what do we say? As I've said, we say some things that are some correlation with what he says. Sometimes we disagree fairly vehemently, but overall, I think all of us would agree. Lifestyle is king. You clearly don't want to smoke cigarettes. You want to make sure that your body mass index or BMI is appropriate. And it's not so much how much you weigh, it's how much fat you have. We used to think fat was inert, harmless, energy storage tissue. Over the past decade, the research has shown that's anything but true. It causes a lot of problems. It causes insulin resistance, which causes the high glucose, the high insulin and early heart attacks, deaths and strokes. So our recommendations are more like control your glucose metabolism, measure it, make sure that you know what you've got. Don't depend on if I've heard it once, I've heard it a thousand times. Doc, I know you look at glucose, but my doc's been looking at this for years and I've been watching him and my I don't have any prediabetes. Until you've had a Kraft insulin survey or at least an OGTT with insulin response, you don't know that. You don't know that at all. You can even do glucose tolerance tests in home. You can use something like a blood glucose monitor, a Libre, which is what, 35, 45 bucks for 10 days worth of reading 24 seven, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You can use a Dexcom 6, a lot more expensive, a lot more accurate, but a lot more expensive. So you want to know what your blood glucose, how you metabolize carbs. You really want to know that. Get your BMIs to the low 20s or decrease body fat to that amount. Keep muscle mass high. By the time we reach age 65 and after age 65, there's a lot of science that would suggest that our major risk factor becomes loss of muscle mass. As you might imagine, that's very much correlated with increasing insulin resistance, it's inflammation, and the things that kill us. So, and then get at least seven and a half hours of good sleep. There's nothing like a community. We saw that in the Louisville event. People got together and started talking about how they've had challenges and successes in preventing their own heart attack, stroke, or chronic disease. It became very clear that you don't have to be a doc with a full-time 30-year career in preventive medicine to understand this and successfully prevent heart attack, stroke, the number one killer and disablers of people. You don't have to be a physician to prevent eye disease, uh, kidney disease. All you have to do is think, listen, and become part of the community. Now, how do you do that? Go to the membership login on our web page, and as you can see, you can get right in. You have, you have to sign up if you haven't signed up already and I've already signed up, I've already gone in. It's very simple, very uh, easy to understand. In order to help encourage this, after the success and the positive emotion, the positive impact that we're seeing with these events, we're saying, look, we need to offer more of these services for free in order to help grow this community. So 
you'll see us starting to do drawings for the webinar event, the courses. We've got a book coming out in, a, in about a month. Uh, we'll be offering that. Even full-blown evaluations, providing those uh, for free for folks that, again, help us grow the community. So if you'd like to find out what the most recent rules are for the most recent drawing, just come to the membership page. Thank you for your interest.